get started. So our first speaker today is Gerson Hosanzada. He's a postdoc here working with Guido Berger, and his main interests are in understanding the final stages of the lives of massive stars from their supernova explosions, and also in, he's interested in optical signatures of gravitational wave events. Um, Griffith got his bachelor's in physics from UC Berkeley, um, and he got his PhD from UC Santa Barbara in 2018, um, and he joined us this past year. Um, he's not currently working on, um, well, we'll talk about this today, the mystery of a supposed massive star in a brightest cluster galaxy. Um, a couple of fun facts about Griffin that I learned from his CV and that we were just talking about. Um, one is that in between his bachelor's and grad school, he worked for a while as a spacecraft engineer at Planet Labs, who's a startup at that point, but is now much bigger. Um, and he also was a music minor and plays trombone. Thanks, Bob. What a great introduction. Um, Thanks for having me here. So I'm going to tell you uh, about a project that I worked on the end of my PhD and just finished up a couple of months ago uh, about a type of supernova that you've never heard about before, probably, unless you study supernovae. So uh, the main idea here is that massive stars, approximately eight times the mass of the sun or more, lose a lot of mass um, during the last during their entire lives and especially during the last stages of their lives. And this includes both the low mass end here, red supergiants like Betelgeuse, and the high mass end like Eta Carina LBBs. So, you know, there's different amounts of mass that are lost and different times that they lose them. But basically all massive stars lose mass at some level. And you should care about this because massive stars are uh, not very well understood, and in, in particular, mass loss in massive stars is one of the least understood parts of stellar evolution. Um, and even if you don't study stars, you should still care about this, because um, if you want to study how galaxies evolve, for example, you should know about how energy, is, energy and material and enrichment of the elements happens from supernovae. And the mass loss in massive stars and the resulting supernovae are all part of this. So um, what I focus on in understanding mass loss is using supernovae as like a probe of the mass that was lost by the star before it exploded. Um, this is a very, very simplified picture of this is what you should have in your head. If there's some material around the star before it explodes, and then it explodes inside of that material, the ejected material from the explosion will run into the circumstellar material, and you'll create like a shock interface here that will heat up the circumstellar material to emit stuff that we can see. Um, and it doesn't necessarily need to be spherical. It can be much more complicated than you see here. But at least there is a way to see this material even in stars in other galaxies that we couldn't observe otherwise. And ideally, this is not exactly for the same case, this particular plot, but the idea is that you want to map out the density profile of the circumstellar material by watching the evolution of, for example, um, emission lines as the supernova progresses. Uh, and in combination with modeling, you can actually get a density profile out and compare that to what you think happens in the last stages of a star's life. So the observables that I'm mentioning in particular are, first of all, emission lines. If you see narrow emission lines in the spectra of a supernova, that probably means that those lines are coming from circumstellar material, which is moving at wind speeds rather than at supernova speeds. We're talking about 100 kilometers per second up to maybe 1,000 kilometers per second, whereas the supernova material itself is moving at 10,000 kilometers per second. Um, and you can sometimes see both components there, so you have to decompose the line into uh, more than one velocity component. Uh, and aside from the spectra, you typically get light curves of these interacting supernovae that are very, very bright because you can add a lot more power from the interaction. The kinetic energy is converted into light that way. And they last for a long time. You can see that some of these supernovae last for years. Um, to be, I mean, they're bright enough to observe for years. And that's because there's just continuous interaction with material out to very large distances. Um, now, this sample that I'm showing you of the very bright and long-lasting light curves, 
These are called type 2n supernovae, which means that they have hydrogen in the spectra. That's usually what the emission lines are in. Uh, and they, we're pretty sure that they come from luminous blue variable stars, like Eta Carina, I showed you before. Um, but there's a much smaller subclass of interacting supernovae that don't show hydrogen, and those are called type 1b n supernovae. I know our nomenclature is stupid, but I have to use it. So type 1b means that there is helium in the spectrum, but no hydrogen, and the N stands for narrow emission lines. So here's like the classic spectrum of a type 1b N supernova, where you have these narrow helium emission lines and little to no H alpha. So this is kind of strange, because you would think that if you're running into the outermost layers of the star, uh, you should see hydrogen there, or, or at least eventually you should see hydrogen. And that's not always the case. So one of the main questions in type 1bn supernovae is, how do you make this hydrogen-free CSM? Um, to, I'm not going to answer that question by the end of the talk. I'm sorry. But um, to start to answer the question, we need a sample of them. Um, like I said, they're pretty rare. Just like a few percent of core collapse supernovae belong to this class. So uh, I did a project a few years ago now where we just collected all the data on all of the type 1bn supernovae ever classified, and that was 22 at the time. It's now like 25 or something like that. Um, and just tried to generate some observational statistics to see what do the light curves look like in general, what do the spectra look like, and how do they compare to the hydrogen-rich counterparts. Um, and the first result is that the light curves are very different than type 2n supernovae. Um, they're still bright. You can see that they peak around minus 20, which is like the brightest end of supernovae that are not superluminous supernovae, which I know is a stupid sentence. But um, uh, they're pretty bright, and we think that comes from interaction power. But they decline much, much faster. Uh, so what you see here in the black region contains like 95% of type 1bn supernova light curves. Uh, and the blue and red lines are other types of interacting supernovae. And you can see that in almost all cases, those last much longer. Um, now, in terms of the spectra, those are pretty different, too. You do see these narrow lines, but the narrow lines can have different line profiles. So at the top, you see here, if you take a spectrum within a few days after maximum light of, the, uh, of a type 1bn supernova, you can either get these p signy lines, which means yeah, you have the absorption and emission. Or you can get just a normal emission line, which you see over here. Um, these, there seems to be like a real difference that you can get both of these types of spectra at approximately the same phases in the light curves. But then later on, like a month later or so, they kind of all look the same, as you see down here. So I'm not suggesting that this is like two different subclasses of events necessarily, but there is probably something different about the progenitor system that allows you to have different profiles of uh, lines at the same phase. So some possibilities for what this dichotomy is telling us um, could be just a different CSM density profile. Uh, I mean, presumably you can get like any density profile you want, so that would be extremely complicated to understand how uh, exactly what line profile would arise from all of that. Um, the basic idea would be that when you see that just blue continuum with p signy lines that are very narrow, you're probably just seeing the CSM and you haven't seen inside of it into the supernova yet. Uh, whereas if you see those emission lines on top of some other broad features, you're seeing a combination of emission from the CSM plus the intrinsic supernova lines. Uh, another possibility is that there's an observational bias here, and we're not observed because these evolve so fast, you don't always get the earliest spectra. Uh, and maybe if you got a spectrum a day after explosion, in all cases, it would show P signy lines. Um, but, but again, this doesn't totally explain it because the P signy lines happen at the same phases as the emission lines in different events. Uh, there could also be a viewing angle effect where those different components of lines are coming from different parts of the explosion and or the CSM. So if you had, for example, a non-spherical CSM, like a disk or something like that, 
which could potentially be caused by a binary system, which could be why it's losing mass. This is all very hand wavy, but there's possibilities here. Um, then if you were looking down at the top of the explosion, maybe you would see the supernova lines. And if you were looking at the edge, you would see the CSM lines. It could be something like that. So anyway, as I said, this is not, uh, I have not answered any questions here. I've just brought up a lot more questions, but uh, this was the first step to understanding this class of supernovae and what stars they come from. So now that I've given you the standard picture of what type 1b and supernovae are, I will go into the mystery of the supposed massive star, um, which is that there was one out of those 22 events that I mentioned before that happened in uh, a galaxy cluster. What you see here is um, radio and x-ray contours around the cluster. This is the brightest cluster galaxy. And here is where the supernova happened in these crosshairs. Uh, this is if you subtract off the bright galaxy there and try to see if there was something faint nearby. There isn't. So the original paper from Nathan Sanders said that this the, most likely happened in the outskirts of the BCG. Um, and that would be really crazy because there's no star formation that's detectable, at least, in the outskirts of the BCG. Uh, and yet, this is supposed to be one of the most massive stars exploding because it has some kind of crazy wind losing a lot of mass. Um, and those should have very short lifetimes. So they should always happen in conjunction with star formation. And we don't see that. So just to stave off questions later, uh, everyone always says, well, was there some other sign that this was different than all the other ones? And the answer is no. It's like exactly the same as all the other type 1b and supernovae. Um, you can see the spectra in black here compared with the standard 1bn that I showed you at the beginning in red. Um, and they look pretty much the same. Maybe some difference in the line strengths, but all the features are there. Uh, and in fact, the crazy thing about this is that this red one uh, is one of the most likely candidates for being a massive star because we actually saw an eruption come from that star two years before it exploded. Uh, and that's really hard to explain with any low mass star. So uh, just for comparison, let's look at the other uh, events in that sample of type 1b and supernovae. What kind of galaxies did they happen in? Um, and they apparently all happen in star-forming galaxies, as far as we can tell. Um, there hasn't been like a detailed study of this, but at least all of their host galaxies emit in UV, or they were so far away that the non-detection of UV doesn't really mean anything. Uh, by comparison, the, uh, there was a limit from the original paper on star formation at the location of the supernova, which ruled out two-thirds or so of previous core collapse supernova hosts. Um, but we wanted to really nail that down, so we had an HST program to just take a really, really deep UV image of that cluster uh, and search for star formation that was below the previous limit. Uh, and to my great disappointment, we did not find any star formation even to these really, really deep limits, an order of magnitude lower than before. Um, what you're seeing here on the left-hand side is the UV image itself, um, and the box at the bottom is just a zoom in one kiloparsec around the supernova, so there's just nothing there at all. Um, on the right-hand side, you see this little dwarf galaxy um, two, two and change kiloparsecs away from the supernova, so there is a small possibility that the star came from that, the star formation in that galaxy, but it's very, very hard to explain how it got so far away from such a small galaxy. In terms of its own radius, the supernova would have had to travel, like, the, the, in terms of the radius of the small galaxy, it would have had to travel uh, several hundred galactic radii out. Um, so that would be strange in itself. Um, our star formation limit essentially rules out all previous core collapse supernova hosts, um, except for one which we only rule out at 2.7 sigma. That was a little bit annoying. But uh, I think that even in that case, it's not a really big deal because that is like a type 2 supernova, which is the most common type of explosion. It's OK to have a really extreme tail of the most common type. But having one out of 22 supernovae in your class be at the this extreme, extremely low star formation rate is pretty unusual, I think. So this, I mean, I, it's hard to explain this. The remaining possibilities, in my mind, are 
it could have been ejected or stripped from that really tiny ultra compact dwarf galaxy. Um, but as I mentioned, that's hard to, it's hard to explain the mechanism for that. Uh, and even if that were true, it's hard for me to understand why it would be this rare type of supernova that is the first one where we saw that happen rather than a more common type of supernova. Um, so there's nothing physically impossible about there being a really, really low level of star formation below our limit. Um, but the probability of us having this observation of a core collapse supernova in this extremely low star formation region is really, really low. Uh, so I don't think that's a really good option. Uh, and of course, the remaining thing is that this supernova in particular didn't come from a massive star. Uh, possibly, I mean, it, you could say that all type 1bn supernovae don't come from massive stars, but that would be really uh, controversial. It could be that this one is different from the other ones, but then why does it look the same? Uh, it could just be that anytime you explode anything within a bunch of helium, it looks like this. But the, simulator, the similarities between this one and the other events are pretty strong. So I'm taking other suggestions for what the answer is. I don't totally know. Uh, just to sum up here, I don't think that we will ever know the answer for this particular supernova. But uh, with the new surveys that are finding hundreds of supernovae per night, presumably this sample size of 20-something will increase very rapidly. And at that point, we can do real statistics on the host galaxy to see. And if this was really the only one, then maybe that's uh, something unique to this event. But if there's some, you know, if 5% of type 1 band supernovae happen in non-star forming galaxies, then that is really telling us something about that class. Uh, in general. So to sum up here, interacting supernovae are a really good way to understand mass loss histories of stars, which is important for stellar evolution and more. Um, type 1bn supernovae are a really rare class of explosions that interact with hydrogen poor or hydrogen free circumstellar material. Uh, and this one event out of 22 in particular uh, is very mysterious because it happened in an area that doesn't seem to have any star formation near it. So that calls into question whether it came from a massive star or not. Thanks for listening. Happy to take questions. Questions for Griffin? Uh, how far is it from the center of the CD or um, I don't remember off the top of my head, but it's got to be something. Let's we can go back to the picture. It, it's like order, yeah, ten or twenty, something like that. Yeah. So we we did consider the possibility that it was a hypervelocity star from the. Ultra compact war. It's not ultra compact war. Ultra compact war is a big global cluster. That that is what that is. Okay. It's it's very it's like um, I forget like a hundred parsecs across or something like that. That is blue. Yes. No, ultra compact wars are red and red. This is blue compact DCG BCG. This is the like the green peas and so on. This is star forming galaxies. It's not ultra compact war. Okay. But anyway, uh, I think that uh, you should try to consider the possibility of being ejected from the main galaxy. Because you know there is much more massive level. Okay, but, but anyway, my point is that it's even hard to explain. It. It's hard to get it out from that nearer galaxy, so I don't see how it would be possible from the, the BCG. That would be, I mean, it would have to move at, that would be like the fastest star we've ever observed in any galaxy. South, south. Yeah, I mean, you, you need that velocity to get it out of the smaller one, thousands of kilometers per second. Um, can you say something about other known hostless supernovae and whether any look like this at all? Um, so, the type 1a supernovae can happen with no star formation, that's fine. Um, and calcium rich supernovae even can happen with no star formation. But the as far as I could tell from the literature, there was no other core collapse supernova that happened where the limit was 
below this limit. So even the hostless ones are just because they happened in some dwarf galaxy that was too far away to see, presumably. Yeah. Brief little thing. So it is important to find find out what this thing is because if it's occurring in the outer part of the elliptical <coughs> galaxy and enriching interstellar medium, then that changes a lot of stories. Depend, you know, depending on what it's rated, it's the rate of this kind of um, <coughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'm aware of only one other core collapse supernova that happened in a galaxy cluster and in a galaxy not like this, but in a non-star forming galaxy. Um, and yeah, the conclusion of that paper was we should really pay attention to this because yes. maybe there is some low-level star formation. Could be trouble, yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Did you say there was some evidence of activity of this star before the supernova? Not of this one, but of okay. another member of the class that looks identical in the spectrum. And the other question is related to Igor's, but uh, what would the minimum, sorry, what would the maximum, no, minimum velocity have to be to get this thing out of this dwarf? Compact um, I yeah I don't remember the exact number, but given, it's like five five hundred to a thousand kilometers per second. Is that for projection? Yeah. Yeah. For, yeah. Exactly. So yeah, that's a, a lower limit. Any other questions? <clears throat> Not let's thank Griffin again. And our next speaker is Fabio Papucci. Um, he um, got his uh, master's and his bachelor's at Sapienza University in Rome. Um, he then mm -hmm. got his PhD in 2016 from the Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa, Italy. Um, and then he was a postdoc at Yale, um, but is actually currently now doing a brief stint as a postdoc in the Netherlands. And in September, he'll be coming to uh, CFA and the Black Hole uh, Initiative Institute to um, start a postdoc here. Um, he's interested in understanding the very first uh, black holes that formed in the universe, how they formed, how they grew into supermassive black holes. And he'll be telling us today about detecting the dawn of black holes. Thank you. So, hi, everyone. Thank you for the introduction and for having me, of course. So today I'm going to talk about the possibility of detecting the first population of black holes, or uh, more poetically, the dawn of uh, black holes. So actually I'll, I will be staying around until Tuesday, and if you're not sick of me after this talk, uh, I'll be giving also a talk on Tuesday at the BHI about uh, uh, very high redshift lens quasars, <laughs> or friendly known as uh, phantom uh, quasars. So uh, let's get to the point today, and uh, my talk is about uh, the, the first black hole, so I will start with a general introduction on the problem, the cosmological problem of the first black holes, and then I will focus on uh, two topics in particular. First, what observational signatures do we expect from uh, these sources? So uh, let's assume to take a random source in a survey, we can ask, uh, how can we understand if that particular source could be one of the first black holes formed? And I will talk about uh, a code that I developed during my PhD in order to simulate the spectrum of uh, these sources. Then, how do we observe them? And uh, I, will tell, I will talk about the possibility of detecting these sources, especially in light of the Astro 2020 Decadal Survey. Let's start from the problem. So the problem is that, or the billion dollars problem, is that we have observations of a billion solar mass black holes less than uh, one billion years after the Big Bang. For instance, these very famous sources are uh, almost a, red, it's a redshift seven. So these are quasars, shining black holes on 10 to the 9 solar uh, masses. And the problem is that uh, in order to form these cosmic monsters, of course, you need to start accreting, growing from smaller seeds, maybe formed around redshift 20, 25. Now, the problem is that between the formation of the seeds and uh, the observation of uh, the quasars at redshift 7, the time frame is very short. It's about uh, alpha billion uh, years. 
So one possibility is that uh, uh, seeds are formed as remnants of pop tree stars with a typical mass scale on 100 uh, solar mass. But now the problem is that uh, there could be a speed limit in the growth process of this black hole, which is the Eddington accretion uh, rate. So in this case, it's very challenging to start from a pop tree seed and reach uh, uh, quasars by a redshift 7. Of course, there are theories that uh, allow for super Eddington accretion rates, so no speed limit. And in this case, it could be feasible to start from a pop three seed and reach quasars by redshift seven. An alternative is that we start already from more massive seeds on the 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 solar mass scale, and in that case, we don't have particular problems in reaching uh, the quasars by redshift seven. Now, how do we make massive uh, seeds? That's the problem. Uh, several uh, proposals uh, have been uh, advanced uh, in the past years. And in particular, we focus on the direct collapse black hole scenario, or DCBH. So how do we form a DCBH? Well, basically what we need is to prevent the cooling uh, and the fragmentation of gas in the high redshift universe. So we did that with a metal-free gas, so that metals, so the primary coolants of uh, in the redshift universe are not present, so the halo is atomic cooling, and then we need to destroy uh, the hydrogen molecules, uh, so the secondary very important coolant in the redshift universe, and we do that with a strong Lyman-Werner uh, flux, so Lyman-Werners are photons in that uh, energy range which are very efficient in destroying hydrogen molecules. So, um, why is it important that we find uh, the first black holes formed in the universe? Well, there are many reasons. Of course, I will just mention a couple of them. First, of course, we know uh, that there is a coevolution between galaxies and uh, central uh, black holes. So understanding how the first population of black holes formed uh, is very important also to understand how galaxies formed and uh, evolved. And secondly, several uh, studies suggest that some of uh, the first population of black holes could be the progenitors of gravitational waves event uh, detected uh, today. So uh, it's true that shedding light on the dawn of black holes will be uh, one of the key tasks that the astronomical community will uh, focus on in the next uh, decade. So the key questions in uh, this uh, field are uh, what are the, the emission characteristics of uh, DCBHs or seeds in general? And how does the spectrum uh, uh, depends on uh, the environment, meaning the metallicity, the column density, and so on? When it comes to the detection, we may ask, of course, are they observable by current and future observatories? And what are the best survey strategies to find them, especially in the light of uh, survey and of observatories in the next decade, JWST, Athena, uh, hopefully links. So our approach was uh, a combination of analytical and numerical uh, methods, and in particular I developed during my PhD a code to study black hole seeds. So on the left you will see the general physical framework of uh, our uh, simulations. So a um, um, black hole seed with a given initial mass at T0 uh, is placed at the center of a dark matter halo with a virial temperature close to the atomic cooling threshold, about 10 to 4 uh, Kelvin. And uh, we investigate the accretion flow on uh, intermediate spatial scales, on spatial scales comparable with the Bondi radius or the gravitational radius of uh, the central source. As I was mentioning there, it's very important to understand that we do not model the formation of the seed. So the seed is already placed at the center with a given initial mass, and then we study the accretion process and the irradiation process. And we do that with GEMS. GEMS is an acronym. It stands for the growth of early massive uh, seeds. So once we simulate the accretion process, the main uh, output is the spectrum, of course, of uh, these sources, the emerging spectrum. So how do we compute them? So first of all, we assume an, an AGN-like input spectrum from the central uh, source. And uh, you see here a typical AGN uh, with uh, the three components, the multicolor, multicolor black body, the power law, and the reflection component. The uh, luminosity, so the normalization of uh, that uh, spectrum is given by the volumetric luminosity of the source, which is computed self-consistently from the accretion rate. And this source is embedded in a 
spherical cloud of uh, gas with a temperature uh, spatial profile and a density spatial profile that are also computed uh, internally by GEMS. And you see here a short video for uh, the density evolution of a slice of the spatial domain. But of course, this is not the most important point. The main output that we want is the spectrum of uh, uh, DCBH or in general of uh, black hole seeds. So here you can see an, exa an example of a typical uh, DCBH spectrum assuming a, a zero metallicity environment. The initial mass is uh, classic, so it's 10 to the 5 solar uh, masses in the classical range of uh, DCBHs. On the right, you see the time of the simulation, the typical uh, time evolution for this kind of source is about 100 mega years. And you can also see the column density going com from Compton thick at the beginning to Compton thin. And it's important to understand that these sources are also isolated in space. So as you can see, most of the energy emerges in the observed the infrared and the X-ray parts of uh, the spectrum, while uh, frequencies shorter than the Lyman alpha here are absorbed and uh, reprocessed at lower energies. As you can see, I also reported, uh, um, I also shown some uh, uh, flux limits for current and future observatories. So the HST should be able to observe these sources marginally, very close to the Lyman alpha, while uh, in the infrared part, the JWST should be able to observe most of the accretion process on a typical uh, high redshift, meaning a, a redshift 10 source. In the high energy range, you can see that uh, the Chandra fields out of 4 megasecond and uh, Athena should be able to observe this source close to the peak of the X-ray luminosity, while uh, links with a higher sensitivity should be able to observe most of the accretion uh, process on these sources. So now I will focus uh, in, on the infrared part of uh, the spectrum and just after that on the X-ray part of uh, the spectrum. So let's make some predictions for the JWST to start with. Uh, the red line here is our prediction for a typical SED of uh, DCBH at the peak of the infrared uh, emission, assuming a zero metallicity environment, as you can see here, while uh, black points, black symbols, are uh, flux limits for the JWST filters. As you can see, we expect that in the near infrared, uh, JWST should be able to observe these sources without any issue. Also, we made some simulations uh, regarding uh, the possibility of a low metallicity environment, uh, low, I mean here, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 3 times the solar metallicity, so very, very low uh, metallicities. And as you can see, due to um, OJR-like uh, re-emissions in the infrared, we do expect that uh, in an increase in metallicity will lead to an increase in the infrared uh, emission. We also... Um, compared these uh, SCDs with other uh, SCDs of high redshift sources, in particular a dusty galaxy, an extreme emission line galaxy, and a standard formation galaxy. And as you can see, uh, we do expect that uh, these sources, these high redshift sources, uh, are much redder in the high redshift universe than other very red sources. And uh, this will come handy in, uh, in a few moments. Just, uh, um, just a second, I just want to mention that we made also some predictions for the possibility of detecting uh, POP3 remnants uh, Cs, so with a lower mass. The problem here, so somehow our predictions are reported uh, here, uh, the problem here is that the JWST shouldn't be able to observe these sources. The mass scale is, too, is far too low. So um, JWST will have problems with very low mass scales like uh, the ones uh, uh, related to POP3 seeds. Now let's move forward and let's move to the higher energy part of the spectrum. As you can see, the typical, our typical prediction is for a bell-shaped uh, uh, emission with a peak about uh, 1 kV for, uh, a rash, for a source about redshift 10. So this is a typical spectral energy distribution for a redshift 10 heavy seed. Now, uh, I'll make two examples here. This is a Compton thin uh, source. And uh, as you can see, the Chandra fields out and Athena should already be able to observe this source close to the peak of the X-ray emission, like this plot is showing. Of course, links will also measure it. 
But the important part is that uh, if we're talking about very Compton thick sources like uh, this prediction here, Athena and, uh, of course, Chandra will have some issues in detecting this source, while the, pre the expected higher sensitivity of links should be able to uh, make these sources detectable. And this is very important as uh, many, uh, many theories are suggesting that uh, most of the high redshift sources could be actually Compton thick. So just to recap this part, this is a classic DCBH uh, SCDs. I'm reporting different lines here corresponding to different uh, times into the simulation. So for a classic uh, meaning uh, Compton thin uh, SCD, you see that uh, in the X-rays is easily detectable and also in the infrared, uh, especially with the GWST, should be easily detectable. Now the problem is that an SCD with a large column density uh, in the X-rays, uh, we expect that only high sensitivity instruments like the ones predicted by four uh, links should be able to uh, detect these sources. And the infrared, uh, JWST should be able to detect them close to the peak of the infrared uh, emission. Now, I'll move on and uh, I'll uh, make a couple of examples of about uh, the current status of uh, black hole seed sources, and I usually divide them into two categories. So the first category is uh, a survey, meaning that we have a lot of photometric data for uh, uh, many sources, and our goal is try and understand uh, if some of these sources could possibly be uh, heavy uh, seed candidates, meaning that uh, we make a pre-selection of candidates. And I'll be talking about uh, two direct class black hole candidates in Goods uh, South find, uh, almost three years ago now. The second category is related to single sources. So we study a, a single source in particular with some spectroscopic uh, information. But let's focus on the first one. So what we are really trying to do here is to take a survey, for instance, the Candles Goods field, South field here, pick one source and ask, can this source host a black hole seed only with photometric uh, uh, information? So this is a very, very hard uh, question to be answered, but we can uh, try, and try to understand, try to make some assumptions. So in 2016, we developed the, the first photometric selection criteria for uh, heavy seeds in the Irish universe. Uh, this is a color-color uh, diagram with uh, H-band, HIRAC-1, and HIRAC-2. Uh, we are in the near, near infrared. And uh, green points are good south sources with a photometric and a spectroscopic uh, redshift uh, above uh, 4, while uh, uh, fill circles here are our predictions for uh, DCBH uh, uh, colors uh, based on the mass that is reported here in the color bar. Now, some of the green points uh, have also a possible uh, counterpart in the X-rays, at least according to a paper in uh, John Longo 2015. I know that this paper is some, it's controversial to some extent, but uh, I reported uh, the, um, I, I changed the, the symbol to, from green points to uh, red stars if that source could be associated with an X-ray counterpart. Now, what happens if we make a redshift uh, cut, for instance, a redshift uh, six? We remain with only two candidates that are here, and uh, let's analyze what are the features of these candidates. So they could be X-ray detected, so there could be some sort of accretion-powered activity in their nucleus. Their colors are compatible with, with the one that we predict for uh, the CDHs, and they are sufficiently far away from us, so meaning uh, a redshift higher than six, uh, for their properties to be still compatible with the ones that we predict for high redshift uh, DCBHs. So these are, uh, of course, uh, candidates, meaning that we really don't know what they are, and uh, we'll, we'll probably have a, a final uh, um, answer about that only with JWST, so these are very faint uh, sources, so we need a spectrum to understand what these sources are. Now let's move, let's move on the second uh, category, meaning uh, single uh, sources, and I will talk uh, as an example of the strange case of uh, CR7. 
CR7 stands for Cosmos Redshift 7, is a Lyman Alpha emitter Redshift 6.6. .6. The original paper by Sobral in 2015 uh, suggested that this source could host uh, a burst of pop three stars. So uh, very, very interesting uh, source for that, re for that re reason. And a couple of months later, we suggested that uh, this source could host a uh, DCBH, so a heavy seat. So you can't really go wrong with this source. It's interesting in any case, you know? So why is this source so interesting? Well, this source is interesting because it's made of three components, A, B, and C. A is the main Lyman alpha emitter. And the main point is that uh, uh, these components are very close to each other physically. It's about five kiloparsec uh, distance between the three, meaning that uh, there could be exchange of matter and radiation between the three components. Now, I remember that basically this was uh, the paradise for uh, DCBH uh, theorists, because I told you at the beginning that uh, in order to form a DCBH, you need a close by source that provides Lyman Werner flux. So when we saw this source, uh, we thought with my supervisor in, uh, the, at the SNS, well, that's it. This is our, our paradise. We, <laughs> this needs to be a DCBH. Well, it's not so easy. And uh, since the 2015, there have been 35 papers theory papers on uh, this uh, source. And uh, I, I reported a very brief summary of uh, observations, but uh, I will focus on, the, on uh, one point in particular. In, 2007, in 2017, um, so new observations detected a strong uh, uh, C plus emission from clumps A and clumps uh, B. Now, I told you at the beginning, uh, uh, in order to form DCBHs, you can't have metals, and that's true. But after that uh, the DCBH is formed, you can have, of course, uh, metal uh, pollution in the host uh, halo. For instance, galaxies merge, stars form inside uh, the halo. So we uh, showed that uh, the photometry of uh, CR7, actually two different uh, photometric data sets, can be fitted by DCBHS models, also in a low metallicity environment, meaning uh, 5 in 10 to the minus 3 uh, solar metallicities. So this is a reminder that uh, also if we observe some metals, uh, this doesn't rule out the possibility that uh, that source is a DCBH. Now, um, just to mention that uh, one year ago with Xiaoyi Fan, we did uh, some HST observations about the UV variability of uh, this source. Of course, uh, if this source is UV variable, this would favor the black hole interpretation because you can't change uh, on uh, a very short time scale, which is uh, about 40 days in the CR7 rest frame. You can't change the flux uh, so much. So we did some uh, calculations about uh, the predicted uh, uh, variability of this source, and uh, we actually saw some of the, uh, some of the variability that we were uh, predicting, and one of the components B, in particular, is varying at a significant uh, level. So uh, it's varying about 4.4 uh, 4, uh, magnitudes, leading to a new mass estimate of about 10 to the 7 solar masses. So we are talking about not a direct collapse black hole that has just formed. We are already at redshift 6.6 .6 here, not at redshift 20, but um, of a black hole seed that has evolved, of course. So this is an extremely interesting uh, object. We are upset about the fact that the variability is not observed uh, in the component A, which is our, was our favorite for the, C, the DCBH, but this is life. So in the, next, uh, in the last couple of minutes, I will talk about uh, uh, what we need to do in, this, in the next decade to detect uh, um, the dawn of black holes, in particular in light of the Astro 2020 Decadal Survey. So it's important to understand that to obtain an unequivocal detection of uh, heavy seeds, we need to probe mass scales of about 10 to the 5 solar masses at redshift higher than 10. This is important to understand because um, it, in order to detect these sources, we need to catch them before they evolve too much. Otherwise, we will never understand how they formed. 
So for, um, with some people in uh, this audience, we wrote a white uh, paper in which we uh, finally brought down the requirements that we need in the infrared and uh, the X-rays, and uh, I will show them here. So in the, for, for the flux density in the infrared, we need something like 10 to the minus 16 air per second per square centimeter. And uh, in the X-rays, uh, in, uh, in the case of Compton thin uh, sources, we need something similar. Now, the interesting part is that for Compton thick sources, we need to go much deeper, about two orders of magnitude uh, deeper, to 10 to the minus uh, 18 air per second per square centimeters. Now, how many of these sources uh, we expect uh, to observe, uh, given that we meet these requirements? Now, this is, uh, um, it's, it's a problem to make these predictions because predictions for uh, the number density of DCBHs in the average universe vary between 10 to the minus uh, 10 and 10 to the minus 1 per uh, per square degree, I think. I'm not sure about the, well, they vary wildly. So. Um, using uh, intermediate values of uh, the number density, we expect with the JWST to be observing in infrared between 1 and 10 of these objects per square degree, while with links going uh, farther uh, deeper in uh, sensitivity, we could observe some, something more than that. We also um, made this um, table about uh, the importance for uh, seeds of uh, all future, uh, some of future observatories that are planned or will be launched in the next decade. So the GWST, as I mentioned, uh, will be important to detect uh, the peak emission of typical seeds which falls uh, into the infrared. And uh, it, uh, GWST should be able to observe marginally also heavily obscured seeds, so Compton thick sources. Athena will be very important for large field uh, of view and for, uh, to do mixed surveys and will be able to detect Compton thin uh, sources. Lynx, uh, as I mentioned, uh, will be very important to detect heavily obscured uh, sources and also with higher angular resolution will be um, without the problem of uh, source uh, um, 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 how do you say it? Counselor's computer, yes. Thank you. I, I, didn't, I didn't talk about uh, LISA today, but uh, LISA will be very important to unequivocally determine uh, the formation uh, channel of seeds by detecting the chirp uh, mass. So just to sum up, this is uh, uh, how we uh, expect the next uh, decade of uh, searches in this, in this field. We can start this decade, of course, uh, with the uh, current instruments analyzing deep fields uh, and uh, looking for X-ray emission, and uh, we have to develop more uh, advanced candidate selections, but we'll be only in the next decade, especially for the reason why I told you before, uh, with JWST and Lynx, uh, that we could be able to detect the uh, dawn of black holes. Now, just to sum up, how will we know when we have found them. The problem is uh, uh, that black holes are still black holes. They definitely don't have a tag attached to them. So forget about the tag. We are still observing black holes. So what are the signatures that we expect? As I mentioned, we need high ionization lines, no or low metal uh, lines, and also we expect a large black hole mass to stellar mass uh, ratio. So I'll leave you with my summary uh, slide, and um, thank you. I'll take your questions. I, I didn't follow all your numbers. 10 to the minus 16 Earths per centimeter squared per second at redshift 10 is upwards of 10 to the 44 Earths per second. So that's the uh, Eddington luminosity of upwards of 10 to the 6 solar masses. But you said tend to the five solar masses elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So that's not, that's not consistent. Oh, yeah. it's, well, it, it depends. So, so why, okay. why ten to the five instead of ten to the six or ten to the four on this? Well, the typical mass scale for this uh, seeds is ten to the five at the beginning. Okay, of course, they evolve and they uh, grow in mass and they, uh, they increase their luminosity. 
Okay, so uh, it's not necessary that these seeds are created yet into a grade for all their uh, lifetime. So we we need can educate guests in order to understand what is the minimum uh, flux limit in order to detect these sources. You're right that this number is close to 10 to the C for for an Eddington limiting uh, an Eddington limited uh, uh, source. It should be around 10 to the six. Yes, sir. So you expect these to be grossly uh, super Eddington uh, and all in X-rays. In the X, well, it, it depends on the it depends on the accretion model. So well, it's, I mean, just 10 to the fifth solar masses at an Eddington limit at ratio of 10 is like 10 to the minus 18 hertz per centimeter squared per second. Again, it depends on the column density. It depends on the column density. So the, the column density impacts two different things. First of all, it impacts how radiation is transmitted. So if you can have super Eddington accretion rates or uh, you are stuck at the Eddington rate. And also how the energy is retransmitted between uh, the, the whole electromagnetic spectrum. So uh, it's right what you say, but uh, you also have to take into account uh, the variable of the column density, which is very important in this estimate. So in low redshifts, if in the local universe, we detect a population of black hole mass around 25. And some of them are very actively accreting. Like we have one that is under 10 to 5, and it's an eddy to the limit of 44 degrees chakra. And there are two more, two times 10 to the 5, three times 10 to the 5. And I'm talking about redshift zero. So the, the very existence of those sources meant that either they were formed from very small seeds, or that they were just quiescent for <coughs> 13 billion years, and then suddenly they started to accrete and grow. Uh, how does it fit to the uh, concept of uh, massive seeds? It's possible. The, um, I wrote another paper a couple of years ago um, on the conditions of optical growth of black hole seeds. So what we did is to identify a parameter space in the column density and uh, in the mass of the seed. And in that case, we see that the optimal mass for growing uh, fast black holes, for rapidly growing black holes, are above 10 to the, six, 10 to the 5 solar masses. So that's the turning point. So what you're saying is definitely true, but it's, it's possible either that, as you said, uh, these sources uh, of 10 to the 5 solar masses are redshift zero, are uh, uh, formed in the redshift universe, and they accreted uh, until now. Or it's possible that uh, they were inefficiently accretors since the beginning. So they form that 10 to the 5 solar masses. They are efficient accretors because they are just at the turning point. <coughs> so meaning that uh, uh, they accreted at very low accretion rates, very low the cycles, and then they started accreting now because they just entered the the the, the parameter space in which efficient accretion. You're claiming that when the mass goes above to the five, the accretion it, it, it becomes faster. It it depends on the they enter the state of rapid growth. It, yes, it depends on the also on the density. So it's a two-dimensional uh, uh, parameter space. Yes. So I have uh, one comment on question and the question. So I think we did talk a lot about so the pattern of light seeds versus heavy seeds. I think no one questions that light seeds is a viable you know, scenario to produce dry poles and no problem that's kind of my hand is putting the seal quasars. Like, so at low regions when we look at the graphs, we can well see the descendants of light seeds. This does not mean uh, you know, conditions for the heavy seeds to mention for particles described in the you know, not there in the heavy seeds. So, more, maybe more viable model is in fact when you have a mix of heavy and light seeds, then the real question is you know, are there any direct collapse events? Because if there are any, those would be one of the most protected events in the universe. So, that's the topic. And then the question is, um, so, this you, you need to catch those direct collapse events very, very uh, close to Sorry? The, you need to catch those events close to the, you know, within the few yes. years of the event. So, the probability might be low. So, basically, you need to survey big regions of the sky. So, 
one of the best way to trace, I don't know in case of this So why those problems you can do is first do an X-ray so that you find the you candidates know, and then follow up with another you know, tool. But JWST will not be up there when you do the So, uh, the first will be, and the first will be able to provide for this. So, will the first be able to provide them for the real good? Well, the, the, as I mentioned in the last slide, the importance of JWST will be mostly related to providing a sort of spectrum of faint sources. So once you have done a pre-selection of a number of candidates, then you observe them with the JWST, you get a spectrum, a spectrum if they are, even if they are very faint, and then you can finally understand if this source is a DCDH, for instance, or not. Because only with photometry you will never understand, you will never be able to understand exactly what they are. Uh, w first, uh, uh, I'm not sure about the technical features of W first, but uh, if it's similar, I remember if it's similar to J to HST, but with a larger field of view. So HST should be able to observe these sources close to the line and alpha, so close to, and it's basically the peak of the infrared emission. So having a survey with uh, W first will be very important to. Uh, in the face of pre-selection of candidates. And then uh, we should observe them with JWST to get the spectrum. How, how many have you done with those? Uh, they are photometric. Both of them are photometric. Based on the comparison with the predictive shape? Yes, I, I didn't make the, the photometric. Uh, uh, I didn't make the photometric estimate of the redshift. Uh, it's a uh, uh, Grazian paper, which made the photometric, uh, in, along with uh, the John Longo paper. They both made uh, the photometric uh, redshift estimate for these sources. And one of that source is at redshift six point one. The other one is uh, a much higher redshift, meaning uh, I think it's around redshift seven. So very close to the maximum uh, uh, redshift that we've found so far, but it's important to understand that both redshifts are photometric, so they are not uh, they are not extremely reliable, let's say. And uh, uh, the problem is that these sources are very really faint, so getting a spectrum of these sources is very hard, and we can't include the Did they include um, an SED that looks like? The, well, for these sources, we have points. So we have photometry. So <coughs> the, the 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 SCD, our SCD of DCDHs can fit these photometric points. But if these photometric points, we can we can almost fit everything. So. <laughs> well, I have a short question. <coughs> uh, concerning the CR7 object, uh, you mentioned that you detect irregularities on the tops. Uh, on the time scale that we're supposed to 48 per second. Yeah. Uh, excluded the possibility of transits like supernova? Um, like what is the energy of this? Mm, no, we haven't considered it, no. So we considered the two opposing scenarios, so one DCDH and the other one a star cluster, because we were uh, we were we were trying to find out a, a way to discriminate between our theory and the Sobral theory in 2015, which didn't include uh, supernova but all, only pop three star formation. But it's also true that when you form pop three stars, then they are going to explode at some point. Yeah. Uh, and we haven't looked uh, into it. All right. As Fabio mentioned, he's going to be around until next Tuesday. So if you're interested in meeting with him, come chat. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.